Hi, everyone. Uh, for this week, you are reading part two of Stephen Shapin's The Scientific Revolution, which is in some ways the most difficult of the chapters, but also the most important. And it is the most difficult and the most important because it tackles a fundamentally philosophical question, which is the following. If you put yourself in the shoes of a 17th century scientist, you know, how do you, who is trying to do science, how do you know what it really means to do science? How do you know when you're doing it right and when you're not doing it right, when the very concept of modern science does not yet exist? Um, you know, so how do you determine that a specific way of going about doing experiments or gaining knowledge or drawing conclusions is scientific in a culture where scientific knowledge as an idea is only in the process of taking shape. Um, so how do you do science before science? That's the question. That's why the title of the, of, the chap of the chapter is how were things known? And so in this chapter, Stephen Shapin makes, makes the argument that it's, you know, it's actually quite complicated. Um, it's not as if the traditional story that we tell about the birth of modern science is correct. It's not as if a bunch of, you know, rebel spirits who did not believe in the church, who only believed in the power of reason, just said, you know, we need to be scientific now instead of theologi uh, theologians or um, instead of being religious or metaphysical. We need to be scientific. Well, that's great, but what is scientific? when you live in a culture that doesn't yet have that concept. Um, and so needless to say, at the moment where this scientific is born, that the line between the scientific and the non-scientific does not yet exist. So it's very difficult to adjudicate. And so that's why it's a philosophical question. It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. You know, how do you have the chicken without the egg? How do you have the egg without the chicken? In this case, you know, the scientific chicken. Now, here, he does something interesting uh, on my view. So he first starts looking at, and, and in a way he's debunking this, this narrative of like the maverick scientist going against the church in defense of reason. He's, he says, it, it's unclear that they really were breaking from tradition in that radical way, you know? Um, and so he begins by talking about scientific rhetoric. Again, not something that you typically tend to think about in a science class, the rhetoric that the scientists themselves are using. And he says, if you look at a, lot of, at a lot of the figures associated with the scientific revolution, people such as Copernicus, people such as Galileo, uh, people such as Kepler, Newton, uh, and so on, they all really emphasize the novelty, the newness of their approach. So they all make a big deal about being revolutionaries. And so in the writing cell, you know, they'll report their observations and they'll report their theories, but they will always make it a point to emphasize how radically original they are. And according to uh, Shapin, this is actually much more of a rhetorical move than a description of reality. And uh, he gives a couple of examples to show how all these modern scientists were not really as modern as we think they were, or even as much as they thought they were. So they were not, they truly thought they were radical, but in practice, they were much less radical than they believed. So let me give you two examples that will come out in the reading and that get developed in, in, in detail. And so you'll be, uh, you'll have to jump into the details in the book. One is Copernicus. So everybody knows the story. Copernicus made a major leap over the ancients and over Aristotelian cosmology, the Aristotle, uh, the, the, the cosmology of Aristotle, which was dominant for a long time, by saying, look, Aristotle, the earth is not the center of the universe. You're mistaken about that. The sun is. And in fact, the earth is just the planet that orbits the sun. If you, look Copernic if you look at Copernicus's writings, again, he, he presents himself as this almost like lone voice in the wilderness. Like nobody understands, nobody recognizes um, how novel my entire way of thinking is. And Stephen Shapin says, yeah, maybe there were 
parts of it that rejected the previous model, but there were some ways in which Copernicus, even for all his radical novelty, for all his originality, remains largely an Aristotelian thinker. And so there is a, this clean break. Um, and he gives the example of um, Copernicus's description of the orbits of the planets. Now, for the Greeks, circles were the perfect shape, you know, because like a circle is the same distance from uh, in every direction from the center and a circle can like spin on itself without it seeming like it's moving. And so it's perfection itself. And so when the Greeks thought about the universe, they, they had this circular interpretation of everything. The planets are circular. The orbits are perfect circles. Everything is a perfect circle in the celestial sphere because it's perfect. And then Copernicus comes around and says, I'm so un Aristotelian. I reject Aristotle. And Stephen Shapin says, hmm. But if you look at Copernicus's description of the orbits of the planets, he still describes them as perfect circles. So in reality, all that Copernicus has done is he takes the Aristotelian universe with the, with the earth at the center and he just swaps the earth in place. I'm sorry, he, he swaps the sun in the place of the earth and gives us a sun-centric universe, a heliocentric universe, but he leaves the rest of it relatively intact. And so there's more continuity there, you know, between the ancients and the moderns than the moderns recognize. And in fact, this is the reason why later Kepler will criticize Copernicus by saying, you're wrong about the orbits. The orbits are not perfect circles. They are actually elongated oblongs. Um, you know, they have this like stretched out shape. So they're not perfect circles like this. They're kind of like this. Uh, and that, that continues to be the way in which we think about the orbits of the planets, uh, of the planets. And so again, just an example of how a lot of it is just talk. It's just rhetoric. And so this is where Stephen Shapin, again, an externalist, uh, when it comes to the history of science, says you can't just look at the theory. You have to look at the linguistic framing in which it's being presented uh, or with which it's being presented. Now, another example, it's very common for people who write about the scientific revolution of the 17th century to tell a story according to which the main difference between the medievals from like before the 14th century, so like fifth, all the, from like the fourth century all the way to like the 14th or the 13th. So the Dark Ages, the, the period known as the Dark Ages or the medieval period. The story is typically, typically told that the problem with the medieval um, epoch is that it was so religious, it was so Christian that everybody just thought that reading the Bible was the way to create knowledge. And so knowledge acquisition is equated in the Middle Ages, according to the moderns writing retroactive writing about this period from before. And so knowledge acquisition in this period is presented as simply obeying authority, like faith in revealed truth, faith in the Bible, for example, uh, or faith in the priest, um, or simply reading the text that, that contains the truth. So it's all about following authority. And you see this even at the very end of the medieval period during an era known as uh, scholasticism, which is when the first universities in Europe start taking place, um, that whenever people had debates, they would simply cite the authority either of the Bible or of other philosophers from the past, including Aristotle. And if Aristotle said it, then it was taken to be true. Or if the Bible said it, it was taken to be true. So this is the normal narrative that the medievals cared only about authority, but the moderns, you know, they cared about coming up with real reasons, reasons that they themselves generated through their own labor, um, typically through research, through thinking critically about the world and so on. And Stephen Shapin says, yes, I, I understand that, but there is a way in which even in the even during the scientific revolution, it's not yet clear 
where that distinction is between listening to authority just for the sake of listening to authority and truly embracing something because it's rational. You know, like the lines have not yet been drawn. And he gives two really um, interesting examples and they're, they both have a visual component. So I just wanna um, draw our attention to them. Uh, so last week we, uh, we talked about the sunspots a little bit. And so now that we are in part two, let me move down. Um, so here you have the um, uh, pre-modern conception of the universe when he's talking about Copernicus. But now let me move to uh, part two, which should be coming. Sorry, it's much farther down than I thought. What was known, so we're still in the what. Here we go. So how was it known? Part two. He has these two illustrations that go again to this distinction between the pre-scientific people who only care about authority and the scientists who don't care about authority but only care about what recent reveals to be true. That's the important, uh, the important point. And he says, um, he, he has this example on page 86. Eighty six. Here we go. This depiction, as you can see, um, this freak rooster or chicken um, with a quadruped tail and a chicken's breast. Pay attention to what it says at the bottom down here. It was observed by the Italian naturalist Pise Aldrovandi in uh, the late fifteen hundreds, and so Aldrovandi sends a report saying, I'm a scientist and I saw this chicken in another part of the world. I saw it. Now, how would a 17th century scientist respond to that claim? Well, kind of tricky because if you've never been to other parts of the world outside of Europe, because of course, transcontinental travel was not a thing yet. Um, you almost have no choice but to accept the claim, especially because it comes from a scientist. So a man with this, you know, credibility of having, of, of being recognized as a scientist. And so why wouldn't you accept his testimony? And so Stephen Shapin says, 17th century scientific discourse is filled with references to facts like this. Now, to us, it seems kind of bizarre. But again, the point is philosophical and it is foundational. It really is. How do you know what is scientific and not scientific when science is only being born? in that moment, right? You can't appeal to science because you're trying to create it. And so again, it, in this case, it's a rooster and egg problem, uh, not a chicken and egg problem. But again, it, the, the issue here is that the moderns would accept this as a fact to a large extent by listening to the authority of people who had the social capital that comes from being a scientist. And so how is that different from the medievals accepting the testimony that is in, um, in the Bible, right? So in, in both cases, something is being accepted as true on the basis of an appeal to authority. So again, more continuity than we realize and a lot more rhetorical framing to create the illusion of a break when in fact, it's a, a little bit more continuous. Uh, it's not, it, again, it's not a clean cut. He has another example two pages later, just to let you know sort of what to expect. Um, and of course, this is an extremely racist uh, depiction of indigenous people, but it passed, the point here is that it passed a scientific fact. Um, so a late 16th century representation of acephalous American Indians. The belief that distant parts of the world were inhabited by strange people who have no heads and whose eyes be in their shoulders was current in antiquity. And it was given a new life by European travelers in the 14th century. 
the travel tales of Sir John uh, Mandeville in the 1300s and so on. Um, and uh, this comes uh, from 1599, so from 1600, the beginning of the 17th century. Um, now, a lot of these debates, again, about what is a fact, were being had at the London Royal uh, Society, which was an elite group of scientists in London that were doing some of the more cutting edge research. And when you look at the at the proceedings or at the transcripts of those debates that were being had from the leading scientists in Europe at the time, you realize that nobody can even agree on what counts as a fact. And so facts are not given to you already packaged as facts. There is a way in which everybody has to agree on what constitutes facts. What are the rules in place for something to be not just an opinion, not just testimony, not just myth or uh, an urban legend, but a scientific fact. And so the point being here that there has to be negotiating back and forth, and there's a lot of disagreement. And so when he talks about this, is the last example before I finish, when he talks about the, um, the air pump, which is a technique or conduct, it's, it's an actual instrument for making experiments with air pressure and with gases and so on that became very famous uh, in the 1700s. When people at the London Royal Society were looking at experiments with the air pump, and this is what he's trying to do with that example, they just cannot agree on even what they're looking at. And the reason, once again, is because what counts as science, what counts as knowledge, that for all of us is intuitive and it's obvious and it's indisputable, it did not yet exist. And so he's drawing our attention to the way in which all these non-scientific forces, of course, shape this thing that is only trying to get off the ground, which is science. Um, let me stop share. Um, okay, I will see you uh, next week when we jump to the last section of um, the scientific revolution.